Hey, listeners, and welcome back to the Third Wave Podcast. Today, I am speaking with Rack Razam and Joelle Briere, founders of Bridging Heaven, a meditation retreat that combines 5-MeO DMT with Vipassana-style meditation. Modern psychedelic culture is still treating 5-MeO like LSD or like psilocybin, like something external to ourselves that we take and we have a peak experience. We're here to tell you that's not the case. This is a relationship with the geography of the divine within you that all cultures across the world have had access to through their modalities and ways of engagement that we've forgotten in the West, in the busyness, in the ego reinforcement. And now we have an understanding and a map of how to take us to that place and how to entrain us into that place so we can remain on. Welcome to the Third Wave Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Austin, here to bring you cutting edge interviews with leading scientists, entrepreneurs, and medical professionals who are exploring how we can integrate psychedelics in an intentional and responsible way for both healing and transformation. It is my honor and privilege to bring you these episodes as you get deeper and deeper into why these medicines are so critical to the future of humanity. So let's go. And let's see what we can explore and learn together in this incredibly important time. Hey, listeners, I am so excited to have both Rack Razam and Joelle Breer on the podcast today. We go deep into the intersection of 5-MeO-DMT and meditation. We talk about 5-MeO-DMT as a neurochemical key and how when we work with it, particularly at low doses, we can combine that with then a Vipassana practice, a meditative practice that allows us to become that much more skillful at meditation and dropping in. It was one of the more fascinating conversations that I've had on this podcast. Rack is articulate and so well-spoken about 5-MeO-DMT and meditation, and Joelle brings in a really great perspective around retreats and holding space. The combination of both of them is really quite a treat and a delight. I first met Joel at a conference last year with his retreat, Tandava Retreats. They're doing wonderful work with 5-MeO DMT education, facilitator training. We talk all about that in the podcast. Rack is a well-known documentary filmmaker in the psychedelic space. He's made a couple in particular around ayahuasca that have been really quite meaningful in terms of setting a, a cultural frame and context for ayahuasca. So it really was quite an honor to have them on the podcast today. But before we dive into today's episode, a word from our sponsors. Hey listeners, I am excited to announce that we are now taking applications for the next round of Third Wave's coaching certification program. This is the highest level and most impactful program that we've developed at Third Wave over the last five years. Years. In fact, it is one of the only programs in the world that focuses on leveraging psychedelics to achieve non clinical outcomes in a one on one coaching context. We developed this in collaboration with high profile executive coaches as well as psychedelic clinicians to ensure that you have the tools that you need to create accelerated transformation in the lives of your clients. So, if you're looking to incorporate psychedelic work into your existing coaching practice, or you just want to gain high-quality training from the forefront of human potential, peak performance, executive training, and leadership development, go to the thethirdwave.co forward slash coaching dash certification. Thethirdwave.co forward slash coaching dash certification. You can fill out our application form and put down your deposit to ensure that you can secure a spot in our next program. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into this episode. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Rack Razam and Joelle Briere. Listeners, welcome back to the Third Way Podcast. Today we have Rack Razam. Did I pronounce that? I, mean, I can restart again, Rack. Is that Rack Razam? Is that correct? You got it. There's only one Rack Razam and you pronounced it right. All right. Rack Razam with us and Joelle Briere. Rack and Joelle, uh, it's great to have you on the podcast. Thank you for your patience in getting the schedule. I know we had to reschedule a number of times. So it's uh, it's good to be here. And and we're going to talk a lot about, I mean, what we just rooted in is really the marriage of, of five MEO and meditation, but we're going to cover other things around five best practices, a little bit about your background and context. Rack, you've been in this space 
a long time in sort of a media storytelling documentary role. And I'd love to just start off the conversation with you about, tell us a little bit about um, kind of your role as a, as a filmmaker and um, just what you've, your, your personal involvement with psychedelics, what you've been learning about ayahuasca in five and how that's led you to uh, where you are now today. Hey, thanks, Paul. It's really great to be here and to connect with your audience. Uh, as we know, psychedelics is sort of the ant pants globally and the, the, the global trauma and the healing that is needed to cope with the civilizational crisis of our times is probably you know, part and parcel responsible for the popularity of psychedelics to help people. Uh, come back to their center and to their alignment and to know who and what they really are. I've been in this psychedelic field for over 15 years as a media professional. It's almost as if, you know, it doesn't matter how we come in, we can be a parent, we can be a, a, a documentary filmmaker like myself or a writer or a journalist as I started out. Psychedelics draw us into their event horizon. Um, there can be personal healing, there can be spiritual growth. And for me, particularly, there can be an unveiling that the world is larger than we believed and that there are, perhaps you could say, you know, plateaus of existence with uh, beings and entities and support mechanisms that the entire universe seems to be wanting humanity at this point in time, not just to heal, but to come home, to know themselves and to know who and what they are and to be part of this larger ecosystem uh, which which have been revealed. And all through human history, people have had spontaneous mystical experiences, connecting with larger sort of um, forces. And it just seems like uh, in my personal journey you know, of awakening and discovery, I started off as a journalist and I was going down to Peru and looking at the mythic archetype of the shaman uh, and the ayahuasca culture that was developing around 2006. Um, that led on to, you know, a book, I Awakenings, which became a documentary film, I Awakenings, uh, and basically, my first five MEO experiences were a week into my jungle, my virgin experience in Peru. I was working with a, a rogue neuroscientist called Dr. Juan Acosta, who has uh, since passed on. And he was looking at five MEO and getting some EEG readings on the brain and what was happening. He has published his scientific research, which has contributed greatly to the field uh, in the last few years before he passed. Uh, but essentially, you know, five MEO for me and I lost were entwined on the path. Uh, I spent about seven years working with ayahuasca. I still take retreats down to Peru to work with my shaman down there, Percy Garcia, Garcia Lozano. But 5-MeO-DMT uh, very quickly became the preeminent driver of my uh, medicine media work. And so for me, basically, I enjoy having these experiences on the cutting edge, learning and digesting my own personal spiritual path but making sense of it and communicating that back to the audience. So I've just relaunched my website, rackrazam.com, and you can find 15 years worth of uh, extremely great content on there about all these psychedelic uh, explorations. And one question that I want to circle back on before we kind of pass it over to Joel, just to get a little bit more context in his work. You mentioned 5MEO in the jungle. Was this with Toad? Was this with Yopo? How, how was that? This was in the, the, the very, uh, you know, forlorn days of 2006. So um, 5-MeO-DMT has been legal for most of human history. And, you know, like most of the psychedelic substances we know, that it's only Richard Nixon's war on drugs and political machinations, which have dared to demonise plants and earth medicines, which have been part of the human, uh, you know, tradition for millennia. And so I first experienced 5-MeO in the jungles of Peru. It was actually synthetic uh, 5-MeO, uh, just oh, wow. dropped onto plant material. And I had um, an EEG helmet on, reading my brain waves, and uh, we filmed it. And I didn't know any better. I mean, it was on the inside. It was literally probably the most significant experience of my life. Um, since then, you know, 5-MeO DMT has only been criminalized in the States since 2011. Toad has skyrocketed the bullfowl various toad, which I've been very dynamically involved with, unlike ayahuasca lineage and culture, which has hundreds if not thousands of years of um, engagement with indigenous cultures, the Sonoran Desert, which is where the bullfowl various toad comes from in the north of Mexico over into Arizona, um, it doesn't have an unbroken lineage with the Sonoran Desert tribes, the same tribes which are to me, uh, uh, books, um, but it's been reintroduced pretty much only since 2012 or so. And so it's from there come out into the world into popular awareness. And it really feels to me that the popularity of Bullfowl Various and 5-MEO 
It's like a stepping stone which has been growing and cresting on the back of ayahuasca coming out in the last two generations or so from the jungles of Peru and the popularity of plant and earth medicine spreading. But each one is like, you know, a specific tool. It's like in the, in the doctor's or the surgeon's office, the suction and suture and scissors. It's like each one does a slightly different thing. And collectively, there is this uh, species awakening and healing, which is happening through these medicines, which I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more. And I love that, that sort of play of EEG and the cutting edge of neuroscience you know, working with these mystical experiences. And then, you know, core of what we're going to talk about today is how that maps on to meditative states and sort of the the distinction between psychedelic induced EEG enlightenment, we could say, and sort of a monk meditative mind and how we might get there. And so that, it's that'll, an that'll, interesting thing. I don't to hold too much room at the start here, but in context of this, this chat, it's so exciting because, you know, psychedelics have been promoted by all the world's media, all the leading institutions, uh, they're looking like they're going to be replaced for SSRIs in the next few years. The FDA and MAPS and, you know, everyone's on board with psilocybin and MDMA coming in and therapeutic use. Healing is coming and psychedelics have arrived. So the question now is, what else can we do with these substances? Do we have to be sick to take them? Um, you know, have generations of Indigenous usage shown us any way we might utilise these substances collectively as groups as well as individuals? or for navigation, for understanding what we're in, not just our own personal sickness? And how do the consciousness maps of previous cultures, like the Eastern traditions, which have left us meditation maps, how do they marry with psychedelics? And what? how do we use those to optimize the human condition, not just to heal it? I love it. All right, Joel, let's 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 hear from you a little bit in terms of, you know, you're you're in you're in Mexico, you have a stunning background. I don't know if our listeners are going to see the video, but it looks beautiful and lovely. You're you you started to host retreats which one of our team members I think went to a couple months ago, Tandaba. Uh you've also started something called the Kaivalya Collective. Uh two Ks there, the Kaivalya Collective. Uh and we had a chance to meet in Miami at the Wonderland conference last year and you've really started to make a name for yourself, I think, in, in helping to temper some of the enthusiasm around 5MEO while still elevating the the sort of importance of it as a, as a tool and a substance. So just, just, you know, just to start with, I'd love if you could open up a little bit about your story, your background, how you got to this point in, uh, point in place, and then tell, tell us a little bit about the Kaivalya Collective, how that came to be, and how that led to Tandava, and now, you know, what we're talking about today. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Um, so yes, you know, my background is actually in uh, yoga and yogic philosophy and teaching the practices along with meditation and uh, yogic breath work called pranayama. And I began teaching around 15 years ago. Um, I was really into psychedelics in the nineties, but I was also into all other substances back then too. So I got clean in the, uh, in the early two thousands. And, but when I got clean, I stepped away from all substances and, you know, I found my healing through meditation and through the yogic practices. And then I was reintroduced to psychedelics and plant medicines around 2006, 2007, uh, living in the Virgin Islands. And I was re reintroduced to them by my two teachers. And this time reapproaching these medicines while having some sort of system of self-inquiry under my belt, such as yoga, was a completely different story. You know, this time when the medicine tried to show me those scarier parts of myself, I didn't try and turn and run away. You know, I had a tool set to be able to face these adverse parts of myself. From there, I got to you know, traveled around the world, studied under some amazing teachers. Um, I lived in India for a little over a year um, and then moved to Australia in 2000, uh, the beginning of 2011. And uh, in, uh, when I was in Australia, I began studying under a Peruvian curandero who was coming there regularly. I became a firekeeper in his ceremonies. And, you know, after a few years of evolution, began working in medicine, working in with my teachings uh, and with my yogic practice. Uh, retreats were really my my juice. You know, I really enjoyed hosting retreats. I started doing it um, back in 2010, I believe, was my first retreat. And so then started incorporating medicines into these retreats around, it's been a while now. Yeah, I started incorporating medicines in around 2014. Um, and back then I was serving an NDMT ceremonially. Um, and it was right around then where I was reinitiated with 5-MeO DMT. Um, and you know, had heroes such as Rakrazam here and 
some other greats, you know, putting out podcasts with all different types of juicy information. And I became pretty obsessed with 5-MeO, you know, after I had my, that, uh, that re, I call it a reinitiation. I first tried it back in 99, but I don't really count that time. This time it was that full blown mystical experience and having a background in yoga, I could only help but notice the exact similarities between what we would call nirvakalpa samadhi and that five experience. So then slowly with the help of some amazing mentors, um, you know, began to shift my practice over to 5-MeO-DMT from NN-DMT. Um, and, you know, I started off then really using the yogic lenses to both prepare and integrate from this uh, work, really using that as the framework and geography for this work. Um, and of course, you know, right around then started seeing a lot of crazy things happening in the community. You know, I'm sure we all remember all the debacles that went down around 2016, 2017, 2018. Um, with unnecessary deaths occurring in the community, a lot of things happening due to practitioner negligence, um, you know, people being zapped with little taser toys and having water pouring down their throats and all that fun stuff. And uh, so really felt a, a strong calling to help guide this medicine into a, a safer place. You know, as Rack mentioned, there's no ancient history or ancient lineage we can look to for wisdom with this medicine. And it was a very strong teething process we were seeing occur. And so it's just been an effort to really work with peers, work with mentors, work with those greater than me and, uh, you know, figure out ways to safely approach this medicine and how to not only make it something safe to do, but make it something where we can really draw life lasting change from it. Um, so, you know, I formed the Kaivalya Collective, which is our parent company. And Kaivalya Collective is a psychedelic wellness company, essentially. Under that, we have our main subsidiary, which is Tandava Retreats. And I'm here at the flagship center in Tepozlan, Mexico, um, where we work on individualized uh, retreats with 5-MeO-DMT that include um, weeks of preparation and at least four weeks of integration as well with each participant. Um, and then we have, um, you know, we've just been having a lot of fun down here, getting to jump into these juicy containers. Um, we recently launched five, which is 5-MeO-DMT Information and Vital Education. And that was the brainchild of my amazing partner, uh, Victoria Wushner. And so she and I co-founded this education and resource platform. And this is essentially meant to be the world's first centralized hub of resources and info around this medicine. Something that anyone from prospective participants to experienced veteran practitioners can go to the site and get information from. And something that's not just about, you know, myself or my company, but really about the community. So we got, you know, we really got as much of the community as we humanly could. Um, together for this and uh, brought in all the different voices to be able to offer a very well-rounded understanding of, uh, of this molecule. And, um, you know, we just launched our practitioner training, which begins in January, and it's a one-year-long, fully comprehensive, well-rounded course with over 35 guest teachers, and Mr. Rack Razam here is one of them. Um, but we cover everything from the mystical to the clinical to really give, um, you know, future practitioners the tools that they need to be able to safely uh, shepherd people to and from this powerful experience. So there's a ton to, we, we're not going to cover everything today, unfortunately, because we or else we'd probably be talking for <laughs> three to four hours, but w- w- kind of the, the point that I'd love to continue on is, and what I always do when I'm, when I have a couple of people on an episode is at what point did your paths oversect? And I'll ask Joel this just to, to get a little bit more more context from him, and then and then I want to sort of go into some of the meditative stuff. But I'd love when when did you and and, and rack meet? What was the context around that, and how has that led to your your current you know, collaboration? Rack and I met back in 2018 at the first World Bufo Averius Congress um, in Mexico City, and uh, I had already been a fan of Rack for years. Had been listening to his podcast in a perfect world for a couple of years before that. Had seen uh, his IAD documentary. And was just a big fan of of, uh, his vibe in general. You know, Rack has a real knack with storytelling. And that's something that, you know, has been lacking from the modern psychedelic space. And so I always really enjoyed how he would bring forth these frameworks. And, you know, of course, listening to his podcast, I just felt that we we had very similar views around a lot of things, particularly including uh, the Eastern lenses and their relevance to the psychedelic experience, particularly with 5-MeO-DMT. So he had me on his podcast back then, I think it was 2018. And, uh, you know, we got to do some fun work together over the years, and we've been talking about this for years and are finally doing it, you know, this, uh, the Bridging Heaven program where we've finally been, you know, put together a retreat that is the combination of these meditation practices combined with low to medium doses of 5-MeO-DMT. That's something that we'd been talking about for a while. And then 
you know, we'd been working with a few other practitioners as well, who all have experience with uh, the Eastern lenses. And, uh, you know, I'd been kind of chatting about this container for a couple of years, and then it finally uh, came together and has formed something beautiful. So we had our first one uh, just in July, and it was a week-long silent meditation retreat using uh, using lower to medium doses of the medicine in, in conjunction with these practices, and it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. All right, so I want to hand it over back to Rack because I want I want to I want to have a better understanding of how that early experience with five and EEG, and especially with maybe your background as a meditator, then led to the creation of uh, this bridging heaven offer and experience. Why is it that you felt so compelled to create this, knowing how impactful five had been for your own sort of let's say the EEG in particular, because I think it's one thing to experience the mystical subjectively. It's a whole nother thing to see the mystical objectively on on a screen, so to say. Yes, thank you. I, I agree. Um, look, 5-MEO can be life-changing isn't enough of a term to describe it. I mean, yes, there can be healing, but for me, there's also this intuitive understanding, like a transmission that is... I can't help but use any mystical language to describe it. In fact, you know, 5-MeO has been nicknamed the God molecule as opposed to NNDT being nicknamed the spirit molecule. Um, the only real difference seems to be the content of duality or non-duality between them. But the realms that they reveal within the human organism appear to mirror identically with 5-MeO the spiritual mystical experience, which may mean a sense of transcending the known world. It may mean a sense of connection, a sense of unity, a sense of oneness. Um, and the periphery effects of um, letting go of the ego and of the imbalances it might hold and the healing that may arise from this substance, I believe are periphery because the, the general thrust of it is this understanding or the potential, if you have the potential to understand, um, of the divine of whatever label we give it. We could call it zero point field, the unity field, samadhi. Um, you know, every culture, every framework has a lens to describe this. But for me, this is the big revelation. There's a geography, and then what one of our friends calls it the theography, um, of the divine that lives within us, which all the world's spiritual traditions say is there. And we now have through the external modality of external 5-MeO, whether that's from a synthetic or a, um, a, a natural source, we have a replicable technology of the sacred that we can go back to this geography again and again and again. And in fact, what we're learning is the geography itself, once it's awakened, can maintain the relationship in the human organism. So when I experienced this in 2006, it literally was life-changing. And there was an understanding that awakened within me of what it really meant. And that understanding is transforming both psychedelics and both life on earth. I mean, we have the divine within us. We can access it. So all through human history, people have gone through different experiences and they have spontaneously sometimes um, had this experience. By the DMT, unlike other psychedelics, the tryptamines, which is what 5-MeO is part of the tryptamine family, are contained within the plant kingdom, the, the animal kingdom, in mammals, and in human beings. We have a natural psychedelic within us, which can be accessed usually within extreme circumstances, birth, death, near-death experiences, mystical experiences, or modulation through darkness retreats, through breath work, um, through meditation. And so what we're finding is there are ways to modulate consciousness to reveal there are infinite capacities within us that the normal bandwidth, what we now call the default mode network or the default mode of being, um, keeps us in. But there's a whole spectrum of reality outside of the, 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 the default mode, which we can access. And when we take a psychedelic externally, it lowers the default mode network and allows our consciousness to go on a journey within or without. 5-MeO-DMT is already within us. So when we're lowering the gate, Dr. Juan Acosta, who is the neuroscientist I work with and worked with the EG headset, and you're right, it totally set an imprint on my being where it was like, all right, I'm not just going to do 5-MeO. For whatever historical circumstantial reasons, the first time I did 5-MeO, which you can see both in my documentary, Eye Awakenings, 
Just go to my website, Rack Razam. I think this week we've got the Vice magazine covered it a few years ago and has the, the raw footage. And, you know, people often say, oh, I wish I had it recorded my 5-MEO session. It's usually not that exciting. You usually see the flesh body rolling about and moaning and blah, whatever. But on the inside, there's this miracle that you just can't capture with, with the camera, right? But uh, we did. In the film, we we recreated the interior journey. So it's worth seeing the film. But that that incident of using the technology to capture brainwave data, and again, EEG, electroencephalography, is only the electrical activity of different surface areas of the brain. Science can't really understand what's happening in your experiential feeling, but we're getting to grasp towards a nexus point where we can marry what's happening internally with what's happening externally. And there are, there are ways. Um, Imperial College is going down to Tandava retreats in a way, um, echoing, you know, these first 5-MEO EEG experiments that Dr. Juan Acosta and I did back in 2006. He continued to get critical masses of data sets over the years, and he published in 2015, 2016, in one of his journals, his results. Some of the results with um, 5-MEO in general show that, yes, it may be affecting the fault mode network, but it's also working on the frontal and parietal lobes of the brain. It's inviting the electrical activity in that area where at least partially we think the sense of ego is generated to lower for about 15 minutes. 5-MeO only um, stays in the human organism for around 15 minutes because we produce it, we know how to metabolize it. As soon as we're taking in, it's metabolized. But for that short target window, the gate is dropped. There's been a seminal study that uh, came out uh, in, well, it's in braintap.com um, a few years ago, looking at um, monks meditating and people on 5-MeO in two separate EEG studies. They compared the results and the results were essentially identical. That what happens with the repetition and entrainment of brainwave activity with meditation is that it lowers the egoic activity by learning to not attach to the thoughts, to let them run, to let them run their course and to go deeper. In the Eastern traditions, they call the mind sattva and it's like an ocean. And they say that we live on the surface of the ocean and the egoic intellectual thoughts, the vrittis, the waves rippling, but it's deep. It's like an iceberg with nine tenths under the surface. And what 5-MeO does, it immediately takes you into that ocean of mind within and away from the surface thoughts and down into the depths. But the two modalities are the same because we have 5-MeO within us. We, know, we now believe that it is the neurochemical catalyst for the mystical experience, and that begs the question, what is the mystical experience? Essentially, like most psychedelics say, it's the experience of the cessation of the ego, not of the mind itself. There can be a witnessing consciousness which is present in the depths of these experiences, just like a baby when it's first born. You'll see first six months or so, the babies are like, they're like distributed consciousnesses. They haven't come down or collapsed into an egoic state of being. We can exist without the ego. My shorthand over many years of psychedelic um, engagement with these spaces is the modern ego for the last 10,000 years of history is a trauma response from a, a global civilizational collapse that happened around 12,800 years ago. And it's come to the fore. The ego is always searching for protection, for danger, for what it needs to do. It never shuts up, just like me. It never knows how to shut up. And, you know, it's like psychedelics. I think this is why I, I came into them in my 20s is they relax the mind and the mind finally has an opportunity to be present with the endogenous psychedelic or entheogen, which reveals the divine within a 5-MeO. It's a relationship because it's always there. It's always within. We're really just discovering this. Modern psychedelic culture is still treating 5-MeO like LSD or like psilocybin, like something external to ourselves that we take and we have a peak experience. We're here to tell you that's not the case. This is a relationship with the geography of the divine within you that all cultures across the world have had access to through their modalities and ways of engagement that we've forgotten in the West, in the busyness, in the ego reinforcement. And now we have an understanding and a map of how to take us to that place and how to entrain us into that place so we can remain on. Revolutionary. 
mind, I mean, egoic mind is totally blown. I'm sure my my deeper collective unconscious mind is also kind of just still trying to get a sense for what was just communicated because there's there's so much there. And one thing I want to I want to dive deeper into, and Joel, I'm just gonna kind of shift the, the the ask over to you and sort of hosting, you know, the retreat that you hosted, Bridging Heaven. And seeing how this actually played out, a silent meditative retreat with with low doses. And this is building on what what Rack had had talked about. You know, when a lot of people think of five, they think of the breakthrough dose, right? They think of 80 MIGs, you know, they think of the pop, they think of white light, unity consciousness, uh, which can be a very valuable experience. And yet it doesn't, I think, necessarily allow for the kind of what Rack was talking about, a, a training of the, geo- the, the the internal geography to actually go back to those states and access them again and again. So I'd love to hear a little bit about why you set up Bridging Heaven the way that you did, how you curated that retreat, what what the sort of you know flow of the retreat was, what were the different dose levels that were dropped in, and why is it that these, let's say, lower to medium doses are so much better at training that meditative state compared to just the high peak breakthrough, kick your ass experience. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So the protocol for the bridging heaven retreat, I think we can kind of call a a bit of a combination or a merger of, you know, one kind of one of our, one of our standard five MEO um, containers along with a Vipassana retreat with a lot of different kind of added flavor to it. And so how we were working with this one is we used pens um, uh, 5-MeO DMT vape pens and all the participants had their own personal pen. Of course, we would keep all the pens and hand them out, you know, at the beginning of the session. But, uh, you know, we would, we would hand out all the pens be- before entering meditation. We would take time. We would do all of our practices. And then there'd be specific periods where a sound of a chime or a gong would go off. And we know for those next 20 to 30 minutes, we can kind of go in on, on the pens. And the pens are measured in a way to where if you get a good three to five second pull, you're taking in kind of somewhere between a handshake and a hug dose. So you're taking in, yeah, speculatively three to six milligrams of pure 5-MeO um, up in that pull. And as Rack mentioned before, you know, what these medicines do, particularly 5-MeO DMTs, it peels back the layers of the mind. It peels back the layers of the default mode network. And when we take these lower doses, particularly in a setting of entrainment, we're training the mind to find that stillness. Because, of course, after you take that pull, it's not that it's just going to send you to a state of stillness. Anyone who's worked with 5-MeO-DMT before generally knows that with the lower or medium doses, it can actually be a little more turbulent than with a full dose where it cuts right through your awareness. There's a little more confusion of the mind as it attempts to get its footing. But even with lower doses of 5-MeO-DMT, the mind can't exactly get its footing. It's still a bit ineffable. And so taking those low to medium doses in meditation allows us to watch the reaction of the mind and surrender our body and surrender our awareness in the face of that reaction and continually soften into the stillness. And so the experience may rise to a peak. It may get confrontational or uncomfortable. And it's about continually letting go and softening into that and surrendering into deeper layers. I definitely found that it uh, shifted my it shifted my relationship with my meditation um, in a great way. And I've had a longstanding meditation practice of decades. Um, but, you know, I look at it like like working out with weights on or, um, you know, like training, training for baseball by putting the weights on the bat. It's if you're if you're practicing meditating while taking in a substance that will cause your mind to kind of flip out for a few minutes. You are training your mind with heavy weights on to find its stillness, to find the eye of the storm in the face of the hurricane. And I found that to be really, really amazing. And of course, you know, then there's the group energy, the forming of, as Rack would call it, that group gestalt where we've got, you know, 11 or 12 meditators all in deep space, all working with this medicine and kind of our awareness or our individual egoic identity softening to a degree to where we begin to merge into group identity. And uh, there's that whole dynamic. And so that was beautiful. But essentially throughout the retreat, we did daily practice of meditation. Um, We would also do walking meditation out in the yard without medicine though. But we would do daily meditation and touching in with the meditation, uh, touching in with the medicine uh, multiple times a day. And then it culminated with a full release experience on that last, uh, on the last full day 
where the whole group went in full release together. And there was a few of us anchors staying out of the medicine to watch over everyone. But it was a uh, it was celebratory indeed. But yeah, very, very, very interesting retreat. Definitely something juicy to play with and to really explore those deeper realms of consciousness when we can use these geographies that have been polished for millennia upon millennia um, by the Eastern cultures and combine them with this powerful acting entheogenic tool that allows us such deep and direct access to our inner workings. I'm curious if you've also... Go ahead, Rack. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to add to that. Yeah, it's it's very different. I've been working with 5 meo well, you know, it's been since 2006, so, you know, a good long while. And, and just in terms of 5 meo culture as it's blossoming in the world and Bufo or various toad has taken prominence with the synthetics around all those conversations. But this is probably the strongest medicine we know of for the weight ratio in nature. And I like to say the only thing that's strong as 5 meo DMT is you, is the human mind, which can resist it. So, you know, traditionally there is this language and sort of context in 5 meo culture about surrender, about letting go, about letting the medicine take you. And that's all true. You know, but what I've found over the years is it's not about um, the medicine per se. It's about the interaction of the person and the medicine. If they're armored, if they're contracted, if they're holding on, um, if they have trauma and they can't open up, or, you know, if they're some of the meditators are so open already that they just need a little push to get them there. But with this work, with the bridgingheaven.com retreats, we are working with established meditators that have their own practice already and understand, you know, anchoring that practice. And this medicine in low doses is pretty much 180 degrees away from that full release, from that fully letting go. We're inviting people in a way not to let go, but to stay with it, to stay with their practice, to stay with their focus, to hold the edge. They're edging. They're learning how to edge and how to maintain that. And what our goal is with this is we do not believe that 5-MeO is just a peak experience. We believe that it is a molecule we contain within the human organism that has the potential to entrain us and to teach us how to um, use our operating system, how to be more than we are in the default mode that we're in. Part of the, um, the lineage and part of the inspiration of this is some of the enlightened beings in, in, um, in India, in their traditions where they have a term for this. They call it Jivan Mukta. It's like enlightened ones. But it's, it's this potential of learning through meditation how to keep the meditative state on. So that you're not just having a, you don't just meditate one hour a day and then go off into your nine to five and not in that state of mind. What we're suggesting is you can entrain yourself into an optimal state of mind where the ego is reduced to a certain degree. And then the bandwidth of what that enables to open up is on to a certain degree. And you can be functional. I mean, this has been proven in India with these Jivan Muktas that they don't go back down from the enlightened state. And they're functional in the enlightened state, that we have a capacity of human consciousness, which we are on the verge of unlocking. And perhaps that consciousness itself wants to unlock in the human organism. So working with low dose 5-MeO is not designed to push people outside of their egoic consciousness. It's designed to stay within it, but to deepen the groove of their meditation practice, to figure out what's happening, to let things sort of clear and to go, and to work also with a really established lineage of teachers, you know, that work within these models that understand the nuances of consciousness and can um, entrain and, and bring people back to that point. I mean, what I found was it was incredible to do a meditation retreat, which I wouldn't have probably done on my own because I've wanted to do for many years, and then to do it with low-dose 5-MeO, which gives you that boost. So many people who were starting out meditating, they're like, yeah, I just don't know how to quieten my mind. I would like the idea of it, but it just doesn't work for me. What we're following, and Joel can talk more about this, we're basically following Patanjali's eight limbs of yoga, the yoga sutras, and there is a sequence that the ancients have left us of how to do these practices in order, which, for instance, the asana is calming the body down, so then the mind can be calm once the body is calm, and then once the mind is calm, then we're working with low-dose 5-MeO. So these sequences blend synergistically and, and optimize and make it a whole lot easier for people to get into the meditative state 
and then to realize their full potential. Like it's just life-changingly incredible, the ability to feel these states of modes of being. And that's what we're really excited about with Bridging Heaven. Thank you. So Joel, that was sort of the 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 follow-up question that I had, you know, to, to Rack's point about sort of yogic philosophy, right? Because because in in some ways yoga is a meditative practice, right? It's a moving meditative practice. In other ways, you know, Vipassana, which you sort of made the comparison to, is is a different school of thought than let's say Ashtanga or these other sort of aspects of yoga. So I'm just curious how you know, Rack mentioned these eight, um, I don't want to say they're pillars, but they're probably eight steps Limbs. that you move through, so to say. And I'd love if you could explain a little bit about kind of that philosophy, how that maps on to the Bridging Heaven, Bridging Heaven retreat. And if you intend to weave in more sort of a, of a yogic practice uh, as part of that, not just necessarily a Vipassana, which is more, you know, emptiness and, 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 and sitting and, you know, that, that process. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start with um, talking about Patanjali. So Patanjali was a sage who um, existed in India sometime between three and 800 BC. And Patanjali compiled a set of scriptures known as the Yoga Sutras. And the Yoga Sutras are essentially the handbook for the system of yoga. He was able to completely boil down the human experience and the perplexing questions of consciousness into a manual and outlined the eight-limbed path of yoga. And so we say eight limbs instead of eight steps because eight steps would refer to a linear function where eight-limbed, it is part of a whole where each part is its own world, but it's they're not necessarily always progressive in order. And um, so the first two limbs are yama and niyama. Yama and niyama are the essentially do's and don'ts. They are the set of disciplines and self-regulating disciplines and actions and systems that we can use to ensure that we are able to take part in our spiritual journey without harming others and harming ourselves. So yama and niyama contain notions like satya, which is truthfulness, or um, ahimsa, which is nonviolence, things like uh, svadhyaya, which is self-study, things like tapasya, which is the discipline of entraining oneself through rigorous um, practice. Things like this, they set the stage and the foundation. Then the third limb is asana. Asana is the physical practice of yoga. This is kind of where we got stuck in the West because quite often when we think of yoga, we think of the physical practice. But the physical aspect is a very, very small aspect. It's only one of the eight limbs of yoga. And the point of asana is to gain control of the body. It helps us regulate and master the nervous system. It allows us to sit comfortably you know, for hours on end without our knees screaming at us. So it allows us to sit in meditation without being distracted by the body. It allows us to master the body in that aspect. The fourth limb is pranayama, the breathing techniques. So there's thousands of different pranayamas, and this translates to restraint or control of the prana. And prana is our energy or our life force, what the Chinese and Japanese would call the chi or the ki. And so the prana can be moved, guided, or directed by the breath. And so with pranayama, we begin to gain mastery over our energetic body. We begin to gain mastery over access to different parts of our nervous system and endocrine system, things like this. That allows us to move to the fifth limb, which is pratyahar. Pratyahar is the withdrawal of the external senses, focusing our awareness inwards. And so this is essentially tuning out what we're hearing, what we're seeing, what we're smelling, what we're tasting, all of that. It is shifting all of that awareness, all of the focus inwards to tune into our inner world. And of course, this is far easier said than done. This is a full practice in of its own. But pratyahar can be looked at as creating a buffering space between what happens to us and our reaction to it. And so pratyahar allows us full entry into our inner world. And that takes us into the sixth limb, which is dhyana intense focus on one point on one pointedness and this is gaining mastery of the mind so this is keeping our focus on one thing um, an example of this could be tradika med meditation or gazing at a candle flame anytime your mind wanders you bring it right back to what you're gazing at this allows us to master the fluctuations of the mind and really find that stillness and then that leads us to dharana which is the seventh limb which is pure meditation flow state absorption and that takes us into the eighth limb, which is samadhi, or ah, 
absolute dissolving in, you know, merging of subject and object. And there are many different levels of samadhi, but two main categories, nirbija and sambija, with and without seed samadhi. So in some stages of samadhi, there is a semblance of individual self there. There still is some egoic consciousness. In other levels of samadhi, there is no semblance of individual mind whatsoever. And it is more experienced as pure boundless awareness, quite similar to where we go in that peak state of 5-MeO-DMT. And um, so understanding and using these, utilizing these systems of yoga, we can look at them as a geography to and from the dissolution of the individual self. The primal, you know, the, the founding tenet of yogic philosophy is Atman is Brahman. The individual soul is the same as the infinite or God or whatever word we want to use. And so the system of yoga is all about non-duality. And it's about priming the awareness to realize and remember that absolute unity, and also about priming the awareness to be able to integrate it upon the return and bring some sort of semblance and meaning into the daily life. And so utilizing that has been a wonderful way to explore psychedelics. And uh, it definitely did get utilized quite a bit in the retreat. You know, it, I would say it was a good combination or good balance between Buddhist style silent meditation and also yogic contemplation, or what we would call yana yoga, the yoga of wisdom. Um, very similar practices uh, in essence. But um, and then also we were, you know, we were beginning the days off with asana, the physical practice, and with pranayama, doing breath work. And so we're using a lot of the different techniques through the days. And then the real juice, you know, in my opinion, is really in the philosophical lenses. And, you know, a lot of the days and evenings were filled with juicy satsangs and different discussions about these different lenses, um, you know, mainly through the yogic lens and the, uh, and the Buddhist lens. And specifically within the yogic lens, I would say my, my, uh, my philosophical outlooks reside within the school of Vedanta which translates to summary of the Vedas and is kind of the philosophical school of yogic school of non-duality. And so using those, we really were able to shape this retreat into something that wasn't about converting people to a specific form of ideology. It wasn't about do this and become a yogi or do this and become a Buddhist or anything like this. It was about using the essence of these practices, using the foundational understandings of these geographies to find which works best for us. Each individual has their own unique path to and from total dissolution. And really finding the ones that speak to us is wonderful. So, you know, during the retreat, we were able to offer a good variety, a good kind of buffet of the, of the Eastern practices and, uh, and philosophical lenses, even though in core, they're all pretty much the same. It's just the, the details that start to get more different and more different the, uh, the more we try and think about it. Go ahead, you know, man. I'd just like to add that um, it's so illuminating when you see in the meditation retreat with low-dose 5, in, in normal 5-MBO sort of um, engagement, you see a presentiment of people's egoic structure, of them releasing trauma, of them learning how to open, learning how to sensitize, purging. Um, it's all happening at once, the internal sort of work and the external work and and you know, going into that space. It's all happening once. But so much of it I've learned from this retreat can be um, prepared for and titrated and sort of processed that we can do our work before, not just integrating afterwards, but in the preparation before. So working with meditators is quite um, a, a blessing because most people have done a certain amount of work and are already familiar with the spaces and then so when the 5-MEO engages with them, it's a very different experience than the normal catharsis that might happen with an average person who hasn't done the work before. And just to say, um, these substances, again, 5-MEO is endogenous to the human organism. It's something we have within us already. It seems to be the neurochemical catalyst for the mystical experience. And I don't believe we need to bring the dog of the past with us into this new terrain. I mean, um, in some traditions, you know, intoxicants in, in the ancient world or in, the, in the, the Vedas were seen as something to be avoided in, in regards to meditation. 5-MeO is not an intoxicant, right? I've had other people that have tried to meditate on things like San Pedro cactus, which is a stimulant, so it's obviously not a good idea to mix with meditation. Um, but, you know, it's... I think we're coming around to a mature appreciation both of psychedelics and entheogens made in nature, and especially the 5-MeO, that this is not something which is a drug. This is something which is a neurochemical, very close to a neurotransmitter within us, very fundamental to consciousness, 
It's not cheating to work with 5-MeO within a meditative lens. It's something that actually is replicating what meditation does in the organism and then you can utilize, you know, by, um, you know, hacking basically your nervous system. You can do a, a darkness retreat for 10 days and 5-MeO, once the melatonin leaves in total darkness after six, seven days, 5-MeO aggregates in the human organism. This is something we have within us. It's not a left-hand path. It's the A path, you know, forward. Um, and it is something that is also not really utilized in psychedelic community, that people think psychedelics is something you take, you have a peak experience, but not necessarily people are thinking of, oh, I'll, I'll meditate on a psychedelic or I'll do yoga on a psychedelic. But the thing is, it's all consciousness. And there's a left and right hemisphere of the brain, and we're all about unifying the hemispheres. We're about unifying the modalities, unifying the potential within the human organism. At this point in human history, as things are hitting the fan, why don't we pull out all the stops and utilize not just these external substances, but our own internal capacity, our, our potential, and put them together? Because, you know, if we can create, if we can assist in the awakening of one enlightened being, one Buddha nature in the world, at this point in time, then I think we need to give it a go. And what you're what you're hitting at a little bit is is that you know you brought up the example of San Pedro Wachuma, in terms of it's probably not an ideal aid for meditation, but vision quests in the mountains with Wachuma is a phenomenal fit. It's how it's been used indigenously. Uh, the energy that comes from a phenethylamine in terms of what it does for dopamine is is great for that. Whereas you know something like ayahuasca. A different medicine, a different context, a different, let's say, modality that may be ideal to combine with ayahuasca, um, which you would know much more about, you know, rack than than I would certainly. Um, same with psilocybin or LSD or even something like ketamine. You know, for me, when I look at how I work with ketamine and what can be really transformative, it's it's body work, and and getting a great body worker that can get into all the fascia that's been stuck. Uh, and ketamine is phenomenal for that because it's an anesthetic. It lasts for about an hour and a half to two hours. So I think what you're hitting at is when we look at 5-MeO as a tool, the way it's often been used in these high dose peak experiences, it's certainly helpful, no doubt. I know a lot of people who have been transformed through peak uh, 5-MeO experiences, and yet likely the ideal way to land it is actually in these low to medium doses with meditation, just like the ideal way to land ketamine is with body work, just like the ideal way to land Wachuma is with a vision quest, et cetera, et cetera. And that that is maybe it's true. It's sort of like God-given intention or, 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 or the way it's meant to be used, like the ideal optimal way that we can weave it in. And we're now seeing that in, reflected in EEGs. And we're seeing that reflected in you know, sort of how it works as a neurochemical key. I think the way you're describing it, Rack, it's sort of like this is how this is how we can get the pieces to all fit together, mapping on to this larger existential crisis that we're clearly faced with in terms of the need to help more and more people wake up into the truth of who they are and what what experience uh, life really is. Yeah. Also, I just like to add that there's this phenomena within five MEO culture called reactivations. Um, in the sense that, you know, either the synthetic or the toad medicine is metabolized by the body in about 15 minutes and it's excreted and it's gone. The mind comes back on into its not old style patterning. But underneath that, what is activated sometimes remains activated. And anytime the mind lowers, boom, there it is. I like to say to people, you are the medicine, right? By the neo is the catalyst, but you have it already. And once you activate that seed of the divine within you, it can remain active. So some people find the first night or the first few nights around 3, 4 a.m., your blood sugar is lowest, the mind's offline, and the 5-MeO is highest in the darkness. And people go back into the same space, sometimes to the same intensity of a full release, and there's no external trigger that they have it within them. This is really unexplored territory because what it suggests is that it's always on. It just needs to be activated. So by utilizing a training program like Bridging Heaven is Teaching, we're teaching people how to find that on switch within themselves and even maybe how to switch it off because sometimes that reactivation can continue. But what it suggests is you don't need the external catalyst. You have it internally and that this is a capacity of human consciousness which other people throughout history have experienced, 
that we can experience that ourselves. And we're also at this juncture of human history that we don't know what the collective effect is if a thousand people reactivate at the same time or a million people reactivate at the same time. Or if we were to do a concerted synergistic, um, you know, experiment in consciousness where we do the thing all at the same time, if there is a collective, what I call a Samadhi mesh network, if the effect gets stronger, the more people that join it in a simultaneous excursion, that these are experiments which we're going to have to do because the potential is so tangibly close. And we know that reactivations happen spontaneously all through other substances. We know that that actually suggests that you have this capacity that you can maintain the onness of. So what what is the effect in the, the culture, in civilization itself, if more people stay on in the awakened state? We are tangibly close to unlocking that door and we need integrity, we need skill, we need love and we need support to do this effectively to look after people in this hugely revelatory and, and rebirthing experience into their full potential. The Samadhi Mesh Network reminds me of those, those um, there's a specific name that they call them, but like when they have like 100,000 people meditate at the same time, I think Deepak like Chopra. Like the synchronized or global meditations, yeah, yeah. Right, where they'll do that. Now, what if we could just get a vape pen, a 5-MeO vape pen in everyone's hand as they so were going through this, this right? Joel, Joel and I have talked about this in other, other panel discussions, but the vape pens are a new emerging technology for many substances, including 5-MeO. 5-MeO is the most powerful psychoactive on the planet. It should not be used recreationally. You can white out, you can leave your, your body, you can choke on your vomit, you can hit your head, you can drown, like a million things can go wrong, which is why you should have a facilitator or a, a sitter present. The technology of vape pens means that 5MEO is going to get out into the community in a way which is uncontrolled. And I, I'm not trying to control it, I'm trying to safeguard the, the, the right relationship with this medicine. What we found is it's not about the, the technology. There's nothing wrong with vape pens in themselves. When they're used in a safe, sacred and sound container like we create in the ceremony space at Bridging Heaven, and when they're used to top up a meditative state, they work so well. They are the, the preeminent tool for this seamless, you know, journey between your meditative state and the deeper meditative state with a pen. So, again, one of the things that we're learning is the container is what's important. So, you know, if we can help the, the sort of integration of vape pen, 5-MeO vape pens into the world, and we're not saying you have to do bridging heaven our way. We're, we've got incredibly respected, well-trained teachers with Joel, with Quilly Powers, with Eugene Elliott, with Victoria, helping us with their expertise of it's all in the nuances. You know, our um, first wave of uh, participants in July, as Joel said, we've had an eight-week integration follow-up relationship, bonding with them, with their practices, with meditation, how they're going, integrating that into their lives. And what we've realized is there's so much nuance. Obviously, we can't condense down a lifetime of meditation into, you know, our five-day bridgingheaven.com retreats. But what we can offer is a container which is safe, sacred, sound, and integral to teach people the basics of how to do this, to continue their own practice. Um, and what we're looking at perhaps doing is recording some of our sequences, some of our teachings, the yoga sequences, the meditative, meditation sort of um, sequences, the satsangs, and giving people the framework to understand you can do this yourself because time is short these days on, on the planet. and this modality is something which, it isn't actually rocket science. Meditation has existed forever. 5-MeO and psychedelics have existed forever. Um, the potential to marry them is sort of like the next step. And people are going to be doing that on their own regardless of what we do. We hope we can give uh, a lineage here, a transmission of integrity of how to use these substances in a way which people will do on their own. Theoretically, you know, you don't even need a 5-MeO vape pen, which is becoming more and more common in the underground. In California, if you're using a THC vape pen, anything that's relaxing the mind, you're relaxing the mind, but you're not just sitting there doing nothing. If you have a sequence and a teaching and a program to follow while the default mode network has been modulated, 
That is what's going to make a point of difference. So we're still evolving as a brand and as what we're offering the community, but we see the community is going to be running with this on their own, and we hope to offer guidance and support for the marriage of psychedelics and meditation. Joelle, anything to to add to that? And I'm sure there's lots that's coming up for you in terms of um, Rack's eloquent description of all of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's um, he's very correct in saying that. You know, the timing is just very ripe for the merger of these two modalities. And 5-MeO DMT and its lower to medium doses just does seem to be very synchronistic. Um, with this practice, it really allows us to just soften into it. And to me, it just seems that consciousness is going through a period of purging where consciousness as a whole is releasing a lot of old patterns, releasing a lot of old everything from the collective and both meditation and working with psychedelics and particularly 5-MeO-DMT is a great direct path to catharsis and to releasing and letting go. And so we really see you know, programs like this and practices where we utilize these tools to access the deeper areas of ourselves in ways that allow us to stay present and bring it back to uh, to share with the community. Um, This is the stuff that the world needs right now. These are exciting times. And it's just really, really beautiful to be able to, to play in the depths of consciousness in such ways and to be able to use these powerful tools that have been shepherded here and, uh, and just get to experience all the infinite possibilities. And so on that note, kind of a final question for you, Joel, in terms of, uh, you know, the retreats and bridging heaven and meditation and yoga practice and 5-MEO, uh, what's the end game here? Uh, what's the vision? What's, what's the objective? And, 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 you know, I think, I think we've talked at, at length somewhat about the, the, the larger end game of consciousness and growth and awareness, but just specific to like, what are the different bells and whistles that you want to weave into this? You know, do you want to start to do more extensive research with EEG as it relates to brain scans before and after people come to the retreat? Um, are there other opportunities to to you know have other retreats that splinter off of this in terms of you know vipassana style or ashtanga or you know whatever it might be uh, in terms of the different modalities? I'm just curious about how you see sort of the growth and evolution of of this offering in particular. Yeah, definitely. Um, I see this evolving in many different ways. Um, you know, firstly with the technologies, you know, we've been included, we've been implicating the, uh, or utilizing the EEG technology in our regular protocols here. We work with neurofeedback, um, with an eight point EEG set, um, here at the center and that type of brain entrainment utilizing the neuroplasticity that 5-MEO allows us, um, really opens up some really potent doors there. Um, and so I'm very excited to continually dive down and see how deep we can get um, at the next Bridging Heaven, we may uh, break out the headsets as well. Well, uh, the EEG headsets and get into some neural feedback as well on that one. Um, as Rack had mentioned before, uh, Imperial College London um, is in talks with us right now for some hopeful research down here at the center. Um, and so we're looking at different ways of framing this research, but essentially we'll be looking at um, getting th- 30 different participants with a full 32 point headset on um, and recording their entire experiences. And so we'd be looking for particularly participants who have experienced 5-MeO DMT um, and can stay in a still position because, you know, that's the tricky one with five. People get dynamic. And so we get the artifacts in the EEG readouts. And so the idea with this be of this would be to be to get as, uh, as many clean readouts of the full-blown mystical experience as we can. And from there, there's just so many different directions we can go. The more we understand the mystical experience on a neurological level, the more we can begin to unpack consciousness and how we interact with it and what it is. So all of these really lead to very open-ended roads, in my opinion. So I I can't say that I can speak to an end game as of yet, but right now, you know, I can speak to, you know, us here at at Kavali Collective, you know, whether it's Tandava, whether Five whether any of our subsidiaries, we're always keen for good collaboration. We're really always keen to partner with different people in the space who are, who are emerging and doing interesting things, you know, finding people who are working with modalities that pair well with ours and seeing which avenues that go, that those go down. Um, us, you know, the four of us teaming together for this Bridging Heaven retreat is one example of just how much I love collaboration and working with different people who, you know, have different areas of knowledge and areas where I'm, you know, I may not know myself and putting together bigger containers and more, uh, more well-rounded containers. But, you know, rather than an end, I see this as a beginning. I see this as a beginning of something that could 
effectively shift the way we relate to ourselves as human beings and in turn shift the way uh, we operate in the world. I love that. Rack, any final thoughts from from you? Well, I, I just echo Joel's um, sentiment. I think that, you know, even though I guess psychedelics are over 70 years old, um, the last the last few years we've seen a, I guess, a return of the, the psychedelic renaissance and this idea of the medicalization of psychedelics. And a lot of the discourse and a lot of the conversation is around personal healing. And that's so needed. I mean, we, we have to be healed to move forward um, as a human race. And yet that's not the only path and possibility of psychedelics and especially of 5-MEO. There seems to be a spiritual awareness, a spiritual rebirthing and a connection to something larger than ourselves, which you don't need to be sick to, to experience. There's this optimization understanding that consciousness is still being really understood and the full spectrum of consciousness is still being understood. So with all the issues we have in the world today, it feels like unlocking our full capacity of consciousness is one of the, the greatest gifts we can do personally but also collectively and what that might do for the world. And so we do invite, you know, people to become part of this experience, to work with the bridgingheaven.com retreats. Our next retreats are coming up um, in January 17 to 21 and July 4 to 8 in 2023. We have a team of four or five of us. We can only do a certain amount of retreats every year. We're hoping that we might be able to get uh, a website sort of brand. We've got a website, bridgingheaven.com, listing the retreats, but we're hoping maybe we can um, add some online support for people that can't make the retreats and have a more horizontal connecting point for the community as well as a vertical one of the retreats. But essentially what we do is we encourage people to think outside the box of psychedelics. Psychedelics aren't something you necessarily just take and have a healing experience. It's part of your spiritual journey, it's something we are psychedelic. If we can activate the tryptamine consciousness within that has been built into our wetware, then we can activate our full capacity of what it means to be human. And it feels like if there's ever been a time to seize the day on your full capacity, it's now. So we would love to work with you with experienced meditators or with experienced psychonauts that have a leaning towards meditation and to marry these two modalities into one unified consciousness for the betterment of all. Blessed be. Thank you, Rap. Thank you, Joelle, for joining us on today's podcast. Bridgingheaven.com is the retreat. Joelle, what's the five education website? Just so we have that top of mind as well. It is five, F I V E, education uh, or five M E O dot education, excuse me. <laughs> five, but F I V E um, hyphen M E O. Okay, yeah. five hyphen meo dot education. Is that correct? Yes. Cool. And yes. we'll link to it as well, just so people can easily access it. Bridgingheaven.com for their next retreats. One is January 17 to 21. The other yeah. is July 4 through 8, I believe is what you had mentioned. Is that correct? And then Tandaba retreats, we have them listed in our directory on third wave. So if you are interested generally in a five MEO retreat, uh, check out Tandava. And then we also mentioned Rack's website, rackrazam.com, if you want to learn more about Rack's. Anything else that I missed before we we close the, you know, end the podcast today in terms of resources or things to check out? Oh, good. That's that's like good. Thanks to all your audience. I mean, it, it, there's so many new people coming into psychedelics. It's a little bit of a fad in a way, but it's a transformative experience. And, you know, for a generation or more, there's been an established community, but it is just quintupling, you know, it's like it's so exponentially growing. There are so many new people, but we're all in this together. And so what we're really trying to do is work on projects which build community and bring community together, enable us to anchor these states of being into our lives to make the world a better place. So thanks to you for listening to this podcast and for getting into the psychedelic community, being part of it. This conversation is bigger than you or me, so please leave a review or comment so others can find the podcast. This small action matters more than you know. 
You can find show notes and transcripts to this podcast on our blog at thethirdwave.co forward slash blog. To get weekly updates from the leading edge of the psychedelic renaissance, you can sign up for our newsletter frequency at thethirdwave.co forward slash newsletter. And you can also find us on Instagram at at thirdwaveishere or subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash the third wave. Thanks so much for watching. If you want to stay up to date on the third wave of psychedelics, subscribe to this channel and visit the thethirdwave.co where you'll find plenty of free resources on intentional and responsible psychedelic use.